And uh, we cannot just put them here and here and here and here. We could in a certain sense, but it creates also a little bit of confusion. Yeah. Because the first key does not in everything harmony with everything what's happening here. Basically what we are doing now, we are taking this history, the last history, and we are seeing here the history of four kings happening in this last history. So four steps, the four steps that we are going to have on that other board now, that we're going to explain, are happening within one generation here of these. And this is what we, what I'm learning to call, this is the fractal, the fractal, fractal, okay? The fractal of the study, taking just a look in this. And as I understand, the fractal is something that looks the same from close, and it looks from far. You go closer and it looks still the same. So if you look close to this history here, we will see the four steps also in that history, represented in the history of four kings. Um, okay. The four kings that we are going to study now are the last four kings of Israel, of Judah, Manasseh, Manasseh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zechariah. <coughs> well, you have heard already that these are not actually the last four kings, because we have three kings that come here in between. But these three kings are not part of these four way marks. Okay? And this is a little bit of this complication. There is a number seven here in this line, because the seven last kings, but these four kings they mark actually by different characteristics the number four, the last the four steps that we can find in, in our history, in the military history incident. This is what we're trying to show. So, just trying to make this clear, but um, I'm at the point that I'm, I'm having to, be, I have to understand these things as well, and it has to become clear in my mind as well. So, let's have to study together and let's go to the history of Manasseh. Manasseh, Manasseh. Um, we find a little bit about him in the second book of Kings, Second Kings, chapter twenty-one. Marco, it's last thing that I Zechariah. Did I say something different? Zechariah. Thank you. Yeah. Page 159 in the notes. It should be Zedekiah. Zechariah? Zedekiah. Last key. Is that meant to be the last key? This is wrong? Yes, Zedekiah. Ah, Zedekiah, of course. It's, it's the prophet. Then. Thank you. Okay, First Kings twenty one. <coughs> Let's start reading here in the first verse. Just to introduce a little bit, I realize that not, not everyone has totally clear in his mind all these histories, so we I try always to give a little bit of more information around so we all are understanding what is happening. And uh, as I have, I think, more hours assigned that I need so I can take the freedom of doing it not too hasty. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hesba. This is verse 1. Verse 1. 21, Second Kings 21, 1. He did that which, that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. 
For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. And so this is interesting. There's a, there's a work that he is, he's not continuing the work of his father, but he's doing a, again, he's doing something that the heathen did. And he's starting here, uh, he's starting the end of the history because of this, of the things that he is going to do. He's starting the end of the history, history of this kingdom. And he reared up altars for Baal and made a, a groove or grove as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And uh, this must have been, you cannot imagine what this means, but when Mohammed came back to um, Mecca to destroy the, to clean the, the sanctuary, then there was also worship to all the, the gods of heaven, and they had 360 gods or something like that, and he only kept one god, which was the god of the moon, which was Allah. All right, but in this king, he was doing more or less the same worship to all the different deities of the heaven and served them. Next verse, and he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, in Jerusalem will I put my name. And this is something special now. What he's going to do, he's not only putting the altars on the top of the mountains and under the trees in different places, but he's putting the work in the house of the Lord. So this is very bold. This is actually an abomination that we haven't seen before. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and use enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the growth Grove that he made, that he had made in the house, for which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. So what he does, he, he puts in the house of the Lord an image. And we will soon see that this is the image of jealousy that he put there in the house or in the temple of the Lord just to put here some of the things or the climax or, or, or the characteristic of what he did yeah, what he stands for you read, you read through verse 7? yes and if you go to 2 Kings 23 2 Kings 23 Verse 26, this I don't have it put in my notes, but in the updated notes you will find it. 2 Kings 23, uh, verse 26, we read this. Notwithstanding the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith with his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations of that Manasseh had provoked him withal. So Manasseh really, he initiated now the judgment upon the nation. Yeah. This is what he did, what he caused. And uh, chapter 24 verse 3 contributes to this information. 24 3, surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did. So this is, gives a, um, a legitimate, makes it um, legitimate to see Manasseh really as the, the end, or the beginning of the end of the history of Judah. Because of all that what he did, all this judgment now will come upon the nation. Um, one of the things that we will find very important to understand here is the meaning of the names of these kings. Manasseh means to forget, causing to forget or to forget.
And what did Manasseh forget? God. He forgot God. What? In the temple which David and Solomon built, in which they understood this is here has to be the name of the Lord forever, he forgot this. Yeah? He forgot that the temple was the temple of the Lord forever. This is what he forgot God. Okay? He forgot the faith of his fathers. This is what is happening here with Manasseh. And this is what his name represents. And um, let me see how I do it the best way. But before I, I go and jump to make the connection to the mirror timeline, one more information on Manasseh in Prophet and Kings. Um, so I don't, I don't have this text here yet. Sorry for that. In Prophet and Kings, page 382. 382. Third paragraph. Prophet Kings 382 is the third paragraph. Faithfully, the prophets continued their warning and their exhortations. Fearlessly, they spoke to Manasseh and to his people. But the messages were scorned. Backsliding Judah would not hear heed. As an earnest of what would befall the people, should they continue in penitent. So, Manasseh is also the earnest. What does this mean? What does earnest mean? Not a word of earnest. Because it down payment. Okay, a down payment, something. And this is the first the first payment, actually the down payment would what now come. Yeah, he initiated now the, the, the fall. This is a fall of four steps. We could also say four generations. This is the number four in this end of the history of Judah. This is Second Chronicles 3311, which is the beginning of the 1843 chart. Thank you very much for correcting This is what it says here. Second Chronicles 3311 to 13. And White right now would quote from that. Second Chronicles 33, 11 to 13. Perhaps I read a little bit on. The Lord permitted their king to be captured by a band of Assyrian soldiers to bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon, their temporary capital. And this is an issue for Adventists today because they don't understand, majority, that this is the end of the kingdom. Because while Nasser was kept, or was carried captive to Babylon, but once your king, the king of your nation, is removed and taken captive, this is the end of the story of your nation. Even though the Assyrians and the Babylonians would later grant them to have still more kings, but these kings were not free kings. Yeah, they were under the direction, like Herod was not a free king. He was like a vassal to the Roman Empire. So likewise, these kings were not free anymore. Manasseh is the end of the free nation. Right. So um, this also we have to put here in place. And um, when we now have this, these informations, Manasseh, he means cause to forget or to forget, and he's the earnest of what would befall uh, the people of, of God in the next generations. Then we have one thing to see that he is a parallel to the time of the end. He's a parallel to 1798. All right? And I think this is, uh, this is very clear. And not, we have heard this already because 1798 something also was forgotten what has been forgotten in 1798 papacy. the papacy has been who forgot the papacy well, or the how was the papacy the the yeah okay what happened here okay let's go sorry let's go to the text I didn't hear you. What happened to the papacy? He was taken captive. 
Yeah. Right. So where was he? He was gone. Does anybody know where they took the, the, the Pope? Huh? Yeah, somewhere in France. They took him to Valence, which is a city nobody knows pretty good in the south of France. He was gone. He was in a, hidden in a little, in a little in a castle. And there he was. He was forgotten. And they could not establish a new pope easily. After one year, they set up a new pope in Milan, I think. And it was, he was not really there. He was literally forgotten. Uh, but we can read this even better if we go to Isaiah 23. Isaiah 23. Verse 15. I think we had this text already and this will happen all during our seminar here. We will repeat these texts in different presentations. Isaiah 23 is talking about Tyre. <coughs> Verse 1, the burden of Tyre. Tyre is, as Ellen White says, the throne where Satan took place. Yeah. Tyre is uh, a symbol of the papacy. And um, you need to read it all, but we just jump to verse 15. Isaiah 23, 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years, according to the days of one king. After the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as a halt. And uh, I think I, this is one of the texts now I, I should have incorporated here, but Ellen White makes a comparison of the 70 years with the 1,260 years of papal rule. So when Tyre was forgotten, this means... Um, uh, I, I think I said something wrong. Oh, forget that. It was not correct. Yeah? When Tyre was forgotten here in this moment, this is speaking about the history when the papacy was conquered. After she had been ruling. Yes. She had been ruling. And after the papacy had been ruling the earth, she was forgotten. But then will come a time when she will come back and she will sing again her song. Um, as a halaj. All right. So, 1798 is the time when the papacy was forgotten, like Manasseh means to forget. And this is, this is now the relationship that we misunderstand that we have with our mineralite time period, because 1798 is the arrival, this stands the A4, the arrival of the first angel's message. Um, One other thing that, that, that you have heard already is that Manasseh was a, a kingdom which had two horns. <coughs> and these two horns were the two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin. Yeah, it was a two-horned kingdom. In 1798 is the moment of the rise, of the rising of the two horn kingdom, the United States, represented by republicanism and protestantism, yeah, which comes into place here, which are the days of one king that comes into the history in this moment when the papacy was forgotten. All right? Um, I have put another text here, which you find on page 159, on the bottom. This is from General uh, Great Controversy, 572. And Anne White now is speaking about the Protestants. A large class, even of those who looked upon Romanism with no favor, apprehend little danger from her power and influence. Many urged that the intellectual and moral darkness prevailing during the Middle Ages favored the spread of her dogmas, superstitions, 
and oppression, and that the greater intelligence of modern times, the general diffusion of knowledge, and the increasing literality in matters of religion forbid a revival of intolerance and tyranny. The very thought that such a state of things will exist in this enlightened age is ridiculed. So we forget, yeah, it is a matter of forgetting that this history of the Dark Ages indeed will repeat. Because it is impossible, we think, that in our time period, the state will, will, will do such laws that they will oppose the liberty of religion and, and etc. The very thought that such a state of things will exist in this enlightened age is ridiculous. It is true that great light, intellectual, moral, and religious, is shining upon this generation. In the open pages of God's holy word, light from heaven has been shed upon the world. But it should be remembered that the greater the light bestowed, the greater the darkness of those who pervert and reject it. The prayerful study of the Bible, and now she's making an important statement, would show Protestants the real character of the papacy, which they have forgotten. Yeah. This is what she says in, in, in these words. The real character of the papacy would cause them to abhor and to shun it. So because of the <coughs> theological ideas, because of the techniques of reading the Bible in a different way than the Bible was given to us, we can understand it. Because of this, they have no means of seeing who the papacy is. And the papacy is forgotten. And this is the problem of the Protestant world. And this is the problem of this history of our church. Because a new technique of reading and understanding the Bible has been introduced through these four generations. We cannot also not understand who the papacy is. And we'll have the same problem. We'll repeat this history that is the, marked by Manasseh as the down payment of all these four generations. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, speaking of the Protestants, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and of the power of God. They must have some means of quieting their conscious, consciences. And they seek that which is least spiritual in humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God. Protestantism has forgotten God because they developed a system so they can forget Him. Yeah? Amen. Through theology, through enlightenment, through intelligence, through science, etc. Through proof, uh, not proof technology, through the proof of the Bible, through the historical principle method. Yeah. Amen. A method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. And this is the, this is the satanic game that he is playing. It, it, if you ask a theology student who is marveled by the, by the techniques that you learn through Hebrew and in history and science of grasping the biblical text, he will always defend, he will always defend that this is the way how we can understand the Bible, but it's actually um, a method of forgetting God. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these, because they have not forgotten anything. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. All right. So there will be more to say to Manasseh, but uh, I, for myself, I think I will get lost if I do too much on him. Now we have to continue with Jehoiakim to see, to maintain a little bit here the, the red line in our study. Jehoiakim is marking the next step, the second step. Ah, one thing I, I indeed forgot. <coughs> Talking about forgetting, I forgot to make the last application that um, 1798 is the history of the Millerites, but what would be the parallel to our time period? 1989. Um, let's put it below. 1989. <laughs> the time of the end. It's also the time of the end. Yeah. 
Daniel 11, 40, part A, B. Second. Daniel 11, 40. Both verses, one touching the Millerite history, the other touching our history. And um, the same history, the same things apply to, to our history when we say that the papacy was forgotten. Who forgot the papacy in 1989? Protestants, again, Protestants in America forgot who the papacy was when Ronald Reagan entered into a, um, what do you say, alliance, thank you, with, with, uh, with Rome in order to conquer what they thought was the beast in history and they would fight communism, all right? So they forgot who the enemy was. Protestants forgot who the enemy, the enemy was. And this, therefore, we can see here the clear parallel to our time period. First step of four steps. Amen. Next king, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Let's read 2 Kings 23. Once again, just to get a little bit of context of this king. 2 Kings 23, verse 36. 2 Kings 23, verse 36. Jehoiakim was twenty and five years old, twenty and five years old, when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And his mother, his mother's name was Jebuda, the daughter of Pediah of Ruma. And he did what that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers has, had done. So what he's actually doing, he's continuing now the sins of his fathers. Yeah, this is interesting because um, Manasseh was not specifically continuing what his father did, but Jehoiakim is continuing now all what his fathers did. So we see here is a progression of uh, work against the Lord, a rebellious work against the Lord. Um, and then in the next chapter 24-1, just to help you the historical Information In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Okay, which was a stupid idea because, anyway, Jehoiakim, therefore, he was a king who was born in captivity, let's say, or in submission to the, to the Chaldean kingdom. He was not a free king, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, okay, so what does this king do, or what does his name mean? His name means to raise up. Jehovah raises up. raise up, or Jehovah, better, Jehovah raises up. <coughs> okay, this is the meaning of its name. Um, I'm always a little bit confused on how should I proceed, but now let's just connect the name to, to his history, then we return and to see a little bit about the history of this king, what he did. When we have just this name, Jehovah raised, raises up, and we, uh, we are willing to see that he is the second step, then we can understand that the second step here, which is the empowerment of the first angel's message in the mirror time period, was 1840, the 11th of August. This was the moment when the second world came into history, it was restrained. And this is the moment when the angel of Revelation came down to the angel of Revelation 10. But how is this angel described in Revelation 10? He was standing with one foot upon the sea and another upon the earth. So we see this angel erected and taking a position 
and the possession of the world through the message that he was bringing, through the light that he was conveying to this generation. So there is an angel which raises himself upon the earth. Um, even easier to see when we make the direct connection to our generation, which is what is our generation here to 1840? What is the parallel generation to 11th of August 1840? The 11th of September 2001, correct? Yeah. correct? Which is the restraint of the third woe in history, where we also have the angel coming down. enlightening the whole earth with his glory and when Ellen White speaks about this angel and you have the text here in your notes I believe this is the famous text from Review and Herald July 5th 1906 there we can read how comes the world that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave as we understand these, this text is making reference to the 11th September 2001 what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord, what shall he do? shall it arise? Yeah? so the Lord raises up indeed Ellen White says that 2001, 11th of September 9-11, the Lord raised yeah? he rises up when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth, then the words of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. So the rising of the Lord we see in both histories, the Red History 8, 14, our history 2001. This is something we understand only by the name of this king. Um, okay, let's go again. Is, is this clear? Yeah. Do I make myself clear? Is, or is this a little bit too confusing at this moment? No. It's very clear. Okay. okay, good. Jeremiah 36. It may be too easy, this is why. Jeremiah 36 gives us another incident, interesting incident of the history of this king. Remember that, Jer that this king was. Well, let's just go here to Jeremiah 36. Um, just reading the verse, first verse and it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah <coughs> that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord take thee a roll of the book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee. So he has to write this book. And this book is read to the king. We don't we won't read now the whole story. But you remember that the councils of the king they got a little bit upset and the king got really upset by what he had written. So verse 21 explains us what he did then. Jeremiah 36, 21. So the king sent Jehudi to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elisha Ma, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudi read it in the ears of the king and the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut, he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the earth, until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the earth. So, this is what this king did. Yeah, this is what Jehoiakim did. He burns the roll. But what is the roll? What words were in the roll? These were the words of the Lord, Amen. written by the prophet. And there is an important explanation of what Jeremiah's writings mean when we go to Prophet and Kings, page 428, third paragraph. Prophets and Kings, 
four to eight, third paragraph. In his testimonies to the church, Jeremiah constantly referred to the teachings of the Book of the Law that had been so greatly honored and exalted during Josiah's reign. What again? How does Anne White call the writings of Jeremiah? In his testimonies to the church. When I would ask you, what are the testimonies of the church? What would you think of? Spirit of prophecy. Spirit of prophecy. So what did he burn? He Jehovah burned. Him. What did he burn? The spirit of prophecy. He actually burned as a symbol. He burned the spirit of prophecy. This is what he did. He burned the words of the prophet, the words of the Lord. He just read a little bit and then this is nonsense and he had to burn. Okay? So he burns the road. He burns his testimonies for the church. <coughs> Which of course is amazing when we look at our history because this is what we see is hap was, did happen <coughs> in this history. In the second generation of Adventism, this is why I put here burn the Bible in the Spirit of Prophecy. Yeah. And they really officially decided that this is nothing that we need to, to hear, that we need to heed when it comes to our decision making on spiritual things. Okay. So this is Jehoiakim, Kim, this is what he did. Um, And um, in manuscript releases, volume one, page 102, paragraph four. Manuscript release what? First volume, page 102, paragraph four. It says, one thing is certain, those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand upon this Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimony, testimonies of God's Spirit. So this is an important step here in this rebellion, that they give it up. Yeah? They give it up. This, what should be the warning for them, the first, we understand this is the first, uh, at the same time as the first angel's message, which is empowered, what the first thing they do is when they get the first message and the first judgment, the first test and power, they burn it and they reject it. And this is common understanding among us that when someone does not accept the spirit of prophecy, he will not be able to understand the present truth. So far, the second king, the second test, the second step here marked by Jehoiakim. king. The next king was his son, Jehoiachin. Um, he was 36 years imprisoned in Babylon. And at the end, I think he was released. Was, was it like that? Yes. yes. But he was 36 years in Babylon. He was taken ca captive and all the treasures and the vessels of, of the house of the Lord were taken to Babylon. And his name may, means to set up or to establish and um, this word Jehoia Chin Jehoia Chin comes from the word um, which is in Hebrew or in the Strong's Concordance the number H for Hebrew 3559, which is Kun, Jehoiak Chin or Jehoiak I don't know how to, how to pronounce it. Do you understand? Jehoiak Kun or Jehoiak Chin is made of, out of two words. The first is Jehovah and the second is this word Kun. And this word means the root, means amongst different things, means to tarry. Okay. So this is another characteristic of this third step to tarry. And this is the meaning of the word. It has different meanings, but one meaning specifically you can find in the Strong's Concordance is to tarry. He marks the third step in this history of the last four kings of Judah. And uh, 
we understand that he aligns through what he did, through what he is, through his name, with the second angel's message when it arrives, the 19th of April, 1844, which is the first disappointment. Okay. When they believe first that the 2,300 years came to an end. So, uh, one thing is, is the, the name that we can align, we see it makes sense. Um, but another thing is, uh, did Joel already touch the first day of the first month? Did you already study this? Oh, you heard it already, and some of you, or most of you have already somehow heard, heard or studied this. But in Exodus 40, verse 16 and 17, we see that on the first day of the first month, the tabernacle is set up. So this is, this is what, what, what I was trying to say. There's so much information. There's so many things happening here. That, um, is this correct? Right? So on the first day of the first month, the 19th of April, 1844, the tabernacle was set up. And of course, this is what his name means, his name means set up, Jehovah. The number is Exodus 40. 40, verses 16 and 17. So he marks the second angel's message. He marks the first disappointment. But in our current time, it is, it, it is marking once again 2001, which is combined. And the combining work is a matter that will be explained better and deeper by our other brethren who are going to present. Um, I think they did not really start to explain this yet, or didn't they? So, this is our time actually right now, and I hope that you will, after these presentations, give a little, receive a little bit more light to this. At the moment, it may seem a little bit complex. Um, another text that we need to see when we talk about this king is also in Jeremiah chapter 28. I would like to invite you to open your Bibles in Jeremiah 28 and just reading the first four verses. Another remarkable event. <coughs> in the story of these kings. Jeremiah 28, verse 1. And it came to pass the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying the following. So don't be confused. This is happening when Zedekiah was king, yeah? But Jehoiachin was still there. He was just in Babylon. He was captive in Babylon. And we will now see that this event has to do with Jehoiachin. This is why we read it now. Even Zedekiah was already king. But this is taking place in Babylon. Well, he was where Jehoiachin was. Why does this have to do with Jehoiachin? Let's just continue reading. Hananiah, the prophet, is making a prophecy. And this is what he says, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. This is good news. And he brings good news to the people. The yoke of the king of Babylon is broken, he says. Wow, really? Within two full years will I bring again, within two full years, given a specific time prophecy, will I bring again into this palace all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, that said, said the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Who is Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim? Who was the son of Jehoiakim? Jehoiachim. Jeconiah is just another name for this king. 
So Jeconiah is Jehoiachin. This is a prophecy about Jehoiachin. He's giving this prophecy in Babylon during, there's already an other reign, but he says, this king, Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, he will come back. The Lord will release him. And he will be king again. And all the vessels will, will come. This is a false prophecy, of course. It is a false prophet giving a false prophecy in the name of the Lord. And uh, you will remember what what this uh, caused the Lord then well give a little bit of time we can jump to verse 10 <clears throat> then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it and Hananiah spake in the presence of all people saying thus says the Lord even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon from the neck of all the nations Verse 12. And then the law, then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after that Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus said the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. Verse 15, Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus said the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So, he teaches in this, in connection to this King Joya Chin, there is a false prophecy, and I, I don't know, but I won't have a problem to believe that the king not really only liked this prophecy, but he may have been behind this prophecy, yes, that he will come back and he will be restored and all will be good. And this is a false message given to this generation. It is a false message of revival of coming back and this is one thing we see happening in this third step that there's a false message and we yeah it is a peace and safety message all is good the yoke is on your wood we can break it we will break it everything will be restored and everything will be as it was it is a false message it's a, also we can say a false letter rain message given here. Would that, would that be equivalent to the time of the Quiet River? No. Uh, this is connected to the second angel's message arrival, which is the first day of the first month, before the midnight. which is just before, yeah. which is the 19th of April. This is, this is the story of the false prophet. The story of the false prophet. Mm -hmm. So false arrival before yeah. This is Revelation 13. Okay. All right. Uh, last step. Here in this line. Zedekiah. Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. Once again, I would like to read from 2 Kings. Now, chapter 24. 2 Kings 24. You have seen that in these chapters all the history of the last kings is resumed. And we can go to verse 17. 2 Kings 24, 17. And the king of Babylon made Matanias his father his father's brother king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 20 and 1 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. So 
even this king also we have read this about all these three kings here they continue to do what has been done before so they continue a work of destruction it's a continual work of desolation of destruction in this kingdom and he will finally face the end of this Europea. and uh, his name means and this is interesting I would explain but his name means the sanctuary or made right right or righteous or cleansed this word Zedekiah comes from a root again a primitive root in the Strong's Concordance assigned with the number 6663 yeah, 6663 and this is the root which means cleanse okay and this is what is his name's meaning made right or cleansed of course this is the same word that we know pretty good from Daniel 8 verse 14 when the sanctuary shall be cleansed or made right denoting what happened the 22nd of October 1844 and so his name goes absolutely along with the event that we can mark in that history the end of this process of the seven sunders of the 46 years of the military history. And this is his meaning and therefore yeah we have we have a pretty good uh, frame now to set these four kings in this history and um, what happened to him just in the next chapter 25 of second kings <coughs> we can read the sad story of his end verse 5 beginning 2 Kings 25, 5. And the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all his army were scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon of Ribla, and they gave judgment upon him. So this king is really facing the final judgment, yeah. not only upon him but upon his generation, upon the history of Judah. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with feathers and brass and carried him to Babylon. So one of the things that is marked here by this king is the eyes are, uh, are taken out, which means he is blind forever. Four eyes never grow back. Yeah. Thank you. So he is marking here, if we go to again to mid history, he is marking the foolish virgins who are left behind and who will not who did not enter the feast of the husband um, of the bridegroom and they were blind forever. Or they were praying to Satan. Yeah. Or if we compare this to our history at the Sunday law, which is the parallel event, okay. they will receive the mark of the beast. Okay. I think um, nothing more I will add in this moment, but you may uh, have seen that there are already many connections that we could have made and that we need to make to different other events. For example, one thing that we will do is connect this further to the history of Ezekiel 8, where we also have four abominations, and where we also end with the Sunday law, and uh, so forth. But um, we will finish here, and let's pray to finalize. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the time and the precious moments that we can have here at this place and be able to study together and revise this history and discovering in marvelous things. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, nevertheless, we need Your intense help that we may be able to grasp the truth that is standing behind all these stories 
that some of us know from the age that we were children. Heavenly Father, you are opening up the truths that we, by our mind, by our capacity, by our intelligence, are not able to understand. Therefore, Heavenly Father, please be with us and help us to see what we need to understand. In the name of Jesus, Amen.